Hello, I'm John Devitt. I'm pleased to be here with Chris Williamson. And we're today we're following up on our campaign with Tiny Tease Models, where we're talking about different aspects of life, mental health, and other issues on how people sort of realise who they are and where they've been. And uh, Chris, can I just ask you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? So, hi, I'm Chris Williamson. Uh, I'm a model with Tiny Tees. I have been for 11 years now. Um, I'm a club promoter from Newcastle. Uh, I've done a little bit of reality TV stuff. Um, I'm a company director for an events company. And I also do a podcast called Modern Wisdom. Excellent. Well, thank you for being with us today and for coming to share your story. So, Chris, if we just roll back a little bit from you, you've got a big career there and you're doing an awful lot of things. Um, we had a little chat beforehand. One of the things that most people might know you from is from Love Island. Yep. Right. So could you just, because you made some interesting points about how that affected you and, you know, what that show did for you, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Interesting, yeah. So I think when a lot of people ask, what did you get out of the show or how was it being on there, what they're expecting to hear is, I got loads of social proofing, I got mm-hmm. to have easy girls for the next couple of years I got to have free bottles and stuff in nightclubs whereas for me what happened was I was delivered a fatal dose of contrast between a group of people who were the person that I was acting out so I was pretending to be this lad around town promoter for 10 years and I lived for four weeks undiluted with people who do live and breathe that and what happened was it it very quickly highlighted to me hang on that's not the person that you actually are. You thought it was. Mm. And having seen them 24-7, you were like, yeah, okay, that's, that's definitely not what I am. That means that there's a problem. Problem requires solution. And the solution was I need to go on a bit of a journey of emotional intelligence learning and some self-discovery, mm. a bit of introspective work, um, and come out the other side to try and actually work out who I was. Mm. I think, especially in the nightlife industry, there's a very typical mold that people expect you to be in. And the deeper that you grease that groove, the more successful that you can be. Right. People want archetypal roles. They want the hero, the maiden, the villain. They want to be able to put people into very particular kind of boxes. And one of the things for me, I think having a slightly more eclectic mix of interests Mm. leads people to not get you quite so easily. And what that means is they don't resonate with you straight away. Mm. And given the choice between honesty and acceptability, yeah. a lot of the time you'll choose the latter. Reason being that you don't want to say something that's alarming or contrary or subtle. Yeah. Because people don't get it. So how is your mood when you're on there? Because you talked about having to wear lots of different masks mm-hmm. all the time. And when you're wearing masks, you, at, at some stage you lose sense of yourself, first mm-hmm. of all, if you knew it in the first place. Mm-hmm. And so bef- I suppose the starting point is before you mo- went onto the show, did you consciously feel you were having to play a role or was it subconscious at that stage to fit in, if that makes sense? So I think with regards to the show, I had a pre-made idea of what they wanted from me and right. what I should do to be successful with regards to the show. Now, the show, the show actually itself wasn't that big of a deal. Hmm. It just ended up being the, kind of the peak of this particular experience. It was the top of this particular story right. arc for me. Got you. And just the little, the right amount of catalyst that was going to springboard me towards a, a life that was a little bit more virtuous after having done the, the introspective right. work. But beforehand, so I've, I've suffered with depression for a long time. Mm. I think naturally I'm quite a depressive person. Um, I, if you roll a, a choice down the top of a fence, I'm always going to fall off on the side of catastrophe, <laughs> right. not, not on the side of success. Yeah. That's my presumption all the time. I okay. think I work in an industry which is very changeable. Mm. Club nights, as anyone who's ever been out and been in the club scene for a while knows, it's very, very quickly paced. And it means that <clears throat> you don't end up with a lot of security. Mm. Because work was my life for a long time, I think that fed back into what would have probably already been some existing levels of anxiety and so on and so forth as we all Mm. do um so the way that depression and anxiety manifested itself for me was that i would tend to stay in bed for a long time so i would refuse to get out of bed or i couldn't bring myself to get out and is this while you were working the nighttime economy or is this yeah so if you weren't working were you locking yourself away not all the time this would come in periods right so i'd have batches i'd have batches of it and one of the worst things is um one of the things that's really insidious about running your own company 
is that when you're the boss, there's no one to tell you not to do it. Yeah. Like I'm not accountable to anybody and I can, I can make up my own excuse. I'm ill today. I'm tired today. I'm yeah. whatever, whatever. I'd, or just not say anything. And like, who's going to, who's going to shout at me? Yeah. Like there's no one above me. So it's all, it's all on me. And yeah, that meant, that meant that liberation was actually <coughs> oddly worked against me. Then. Right. Um, but yeah, so depression for me manifested itself in terms of me. I would stay in bed. I would get myself into negative thought loops. Yeah. I think a lot of the time when people don't have something very, very tacit that is the cause of their depression, when it's this kind of nebulous sense of dread, this drowning in thoughts yeah. that really don't have a reason or a purpose to them. I, I haven't been through some psychological catastrophe, not a major one. I haven't been, I haven't had a, any incredibly traumatic events, anything like that. And yet I was still suffering with depression and that thought loop of the shame behind being defeated by essentially what I felt as nothing. Mm. Like I haven't, the, the nothing catastrophics happened and I still am getting defeated by this and I can't get out of bed. Yeah. There was a lot of shame associated with that. Yeah. And I thought, like, I shouldn't be like this. I should be able to deal with it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, how old were you when you first became aware that there, you might be subject to low moods, depression, and these sort of conditions that I you're just I, talking about? Now? I think I always have. So I, I remember at uni, so right. like late teens, 19, 20. Right. Um, and, you know, badly enough, it took me until I was on Love Island at 27, and I still didn't really have the tools in my arsenal to be able to deal with it. Right. Um, so, you know, it, I... I I suffered with these batches of depression, depressive periods for a long time. Um, and yeah, so the, the, the Love Island thing came about. And like I say, well, it wasn't about, it wasn't about being on the show. It wasn't no. about the actual experience. It was just about the fact that it became a little mountain. Uh, uh, it was like the zenith of everything that had come together before that. Right. And it, it sounds like, in correct me if wrong, what you're saying, it was a catalyst as much for, the, for that point to change, though. So before moving on to discussing that, what, what those changes were and what helped you, mm -hmm. in the period beforehand, what support or help who, did you, were people around you aware of how you felt? Not did really. Did you ever talk or did you get any, ask for help? At no, that stage? no, I didn't. So, I mean, that was. Like I say, one of the problems was that I I was associating being vulnerable, i.e. opening up with being weak, mm. which is wrong. As far as I'm concerned, showing your vulnerabilities is one of the strongest things that you can do. Yeah. And yeah, it meant that I was I was solely at the mercy of whatever experience I was going through. I'm an only child. Right. Um so I don't have close family like that. We don't have a broad family outside of that either. And the club promo world is inherently a very transactional set of relationships. Yeah. And if you're not being tremendously virtuous or, or connecting with, if you're not connecting with people that are on a similar level to yourself and have similar interests, et cetera, et cetera, it can be really, really lonely at times, mm. which sounds converse, right? When we're running a club night and I've got 2000 people who all know my name that have just gone through the doors. And yet you can be stood on the front door and actually feel quite alone. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it's an interesting dynamic, especially when people see, you know, for the people who do know what I do or who I am, you see the 80,000 followers on Instagram, you see the, you know, going away on holidays, running club nights. For a lot of people, that sounds like a dream life. And it was a lot less about the quantifiable metrics of success and a lot more about me not understanding my own mind. Um, so did you yeah. enjoy it though so i get a sense a, a, a real sense of uh fulfillment from succeeding from overcoming right. tasks and so on and so forth my passion for partying itself has yeah. waned a little but i still enjoy we've just gone through freshers week right. standing on the front door of a club that you've worked a club night you've worked up to for two months and seeing cues out the door and you yeah. know that there's still a buzz behind that regardless of the fact that I'm drinking a water instead of a, a beer like you know there's still a lot of excitement yeah. behind that and the, the job's always been fulfilling me and my business partner have started it and we've been going for 10 years I, it does fulfill me but I don't think that the atmosphere of the industry overall is fantastic for right. mental health I think that it's hyper hyper masculine 
Right. Um, especially for the guys. There's a, a mold that most club promoters are expected to fit. Yeah. And showing vulnerability, sh- showing any real intellectual virtue, is it's yeah. just not part and parcel of it. It's lads and birds and booze and, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's that. It's not introspective work and have you read Carlo Ravelli's new book and did you see Jordan Peterson's most recent podcast? Yeah, yeah. So if those, are your, um, if those are your interests, we come back to given a choice between honesty and acceptability, yeah. choose the latter. So if you, and I think this is a really important point because clearly although you were in an industry that you're actually sort of enjoying, you know, you get validation from, you're getting connections with people, it's still quite transitory. So actually you've got all those relationships around you. I suppose, where did you, before you made the changes that we're going to go on and talk to you about, mm-hmm. where did you get that sort of, did you have those deeper relationships with any other source? Not really, um, which I guess is quite sad to think of. Right. The fact that I'd, I had girlfriends and, and you know, they, they, we, we got on super, super well. But it was like, before I did the introspective work, that allowed me to begin to uncover some of my biases and some of my beliefs and start to live with a lot more integrity and virtue and speak my truth forward and Mm. enact the logos, as Jordan Peterson would say. Before I did that, it was like I'd placed a glass ceiling on top or a glass floor on the depth of connection that I could have with someone. Right. Um, And that was because I wasn't prepared. Firstly, I don't think I actually knew who I was to a, a, a broad degree. I'd played the acceptability over honesty game so many times that I didn't even know what yeah, honesty yeah. for myself meant. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, you know, I'm used to being on my own. I grew up on my own. Any only child who is listening will know the exact same feeling that it is. You're under socialized. It is impossible for mm-hmm. your parents to socialize you as an only child to the same level yeah. as someone that's got siblings. It does not matter how sociable, uh, mm-hmm. how sociable your parents are. It is impossible. Hmm. And I think that carried forward as I got later in life that I thought, well, I've dealt with loneliness and anxiety and stuff like that before because Hmm. that was, to one degree or another, was a part of my upbringing. So, fine. This is just the next step. Maybe this is is just what life is. Um, And then, yeah. So, that was... That was that, I guess. Like the, the depth of connection, the depth of relationship was quite low. Right. Um, that's not to say that I didn't have good friendships, which I did. No. But again, I'd placed these barriers, I'd placed confines around how deep I was prepared to go and how deep I was able to go mm. as well. So when you go back, and if you think back to that period, because it's, it's quite an interesting one, we, we hear this sort of this these discussions around people having to play certain roles, play, put certain masks on, mm-hmm. not just, I'm not talking about the TV show, mm-hmm. but actually through life mm-hmm. when you come through. 100%. Actually, when, when, when we're talking about recovery, the hardest bit isn't ki- kicking drugs or dealing with anxiety or dealing with alcohol, for example. It's actually about looking at yourself for the first time. Mm-hmm. And quite often that's one of those sort of challenges. If you were to look at the circle of people you, you sort of knew previously before you had those deep relationships, shall we mm-hmm. say. How many people around you can you look back on and see also were wearing those sort of masks? Well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because everyone's good at playing the game. Yeah. It's difficult to work out who is wearing the mask because a lot of people wear it incredibly effectively. Yeah. Um, like I say, you know, there's a, anyone who would have known me three years ago or five years ago, maybe if they had a really, really good sense of awareness, they would have gone, Yeah. Chris is not quite... Not, not quite 100% or whatever, but I think I, I, think I played a pretty successful game at, yeah. hi, at hiding my uh, depressive periods. And that's not to say I was depressed all the time. At its worst, how did, how did your depression sort of feel at that time? Are there any particular instances that sort of jump out to you? No, unfortunately. So mm. I didn't have a single traumatic event. It mm. was just this pervasive, consistent, underlying low-level anxiety uh, Big lack of gratitude, big mm-hmm. lack of compassion, self-love. Um, it wasn't, let's say, uh, nothing catastrophic happened. But there was periods where it would be three or four days where I wouldn't get out of bed. Broadly, 
I'd maybe go to the shop and I'd see people and I'd make excuses. There was a couple of periods where it was sort of three or four days without leaving the house right. because I just couldn't bring myself to, to leave. I didn't want to see people. I didn't want to have to do things. And we were doing well. The business was successful. Mm. We were able to take over and, and I was able to, in the same way that a drug or an alcohol addict can hide their substance abuse from people, I was able to hide my depression from people because mm. I played this role of being big dick lad around town you know really cool oh, yeah. this sort of aspirational guy remembering that we've got a team of we have 400 staff that work for us and between myself and my business partner we're supposed to be the two leaders of that company Ooh. we're supposed to be setting an example for people like what sort of an example is it that your boss can't get himself out of bed for four yeah. days so there was a lot of shame associated with that um and i i think i felt a lot I didn't really even know it at the time. I was just so ignorant. I didn't even know that I was at the mercy of something. I just thought that's what life was like. Right. Um, and I think a lot of that was just due to not putting in the time. I wasn't, I wasn't learning about depression. Like, I'd, I'd never once typed into Google, what is depression? Yeah. Like, there was, I'm pretty certain I've maybe had one or two anxiety attacks in my life. Um, and I remember it happening. And me going in, I wanted to go and have a shower because I was shaking. And I thought, I'm shaking, I must be cold. But I had a shower in the warm shower and I didn't stop shaking I was like that's weird mm. and it took it was like two years three years later where I was like oh it's probably an anxiety attack yeah. when I read about it I'm like how it, it's just it was so bizarre that it was staring me in the face that I was suffering with depression but I'd hidden it so well I'd, the shame associated with not with the um, outcomes which were not getting out of bed and not yeah, wanting yeah. to speak to people they were so um I was so worried about being rumbled for those that I, I, was, I hadn't even put the work in to work out what I was suffering with myself. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and I, th- I think it's a really interesting point, this, because actually what you've highlighted are very classic behaviours which are indicative of these sort of conditions. Mm-hmm. But actually, in, and you've said a few times that, well, you know, you hadn't put the work into understanding what it was. Would you have been capable of doing that at that time? Because a lot of this is, comes down to self-awareness in other people. Mm-hmm. And as you said, the shame of the behaviour of staying in bed. In a way, it's, it's sort of been quite hard on yourself. Very much so. About, but that's because of the journey you come on. How much do you think stems? You said there was no sort of major trauma that st- stimulated these sort of things. What about self-esteem? And where you saw it? How did you view yourself when you, right at the start of these when you sort of put these masks on to fit in or to develop in that industry, do you, do you see where I'm coming from? I understand. Yeah. I think... I think I'm a lot deeper than I gave myself credit for. Right. And one of the problems of that was that I... My self-esteem now, yeah. nowadays, is very, very heavily born of what I, what I know how understanding and compassionate and grateful I am for things, how mm. I'm able to help other people with stuff that's really fulfilling to me, like the podcast, etc., etc. But because I had none of those things in my life at that time, I was living this very transactional relationship that was people on the door of a club, money in, money out, etc., etc. And although it was fun, and that was the life that a lot of other young people lead, you know, like the partying mm. lifestyle and... I didn't fit that mold and that wasn't what an enjoyable life meant to me but because I didn't know anything else that was the that was the model I was following so there was an, an unconscious disconnect from actually your whole life yep. really and what you were living and what you were doing very much so so if we move on to how actually you, you, we talked a little bit earlier about how Love Island became that sort of catalyst that sort of you talked about apex that it mm-hmm. came into mm-hmm. what was the the first process is thought process that you thought, hang on, there's more to the more to me than this. How did that come about? So I didn't I didn't have a particularly eureka moment with that. And I think mm. one of the things one of the things that kind of comes up from this story generally is that you mentioned just before, why or how long had it occurred for and why would you have been able to yeah. Would you have been able to get stuck in and do the work early on? And we all like to think that we can expedite our progress, right? We yeah. all want to think that we can get to this by reading a book summary or by listening to a podcast that cites quotes. Yeah. But without context and without the right mindset to accept these sort of things 
and without really, really working hard and spending what you'd call in the gym time under tension. Yeah. Without doing that, all of this is a waste. And the perfect example for this is anyone who's listening at home, think about the last time you scrolled down your Instagram feed and you saw an inspirational quote that someone put up. Why did that inspirational quote not change your life? Mm. It's because there wasn't enough time and attention. You weren't in the right frame of mind. It didn't resonate with you. There was no context. Mm. So for me, weirdly enough, you're probably right that even if I'd had the tools at my disposal when I was 24, 25, I just wasn't, for some bizarre reason, I don't really know what it is. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to, mm. to make that realization. And there's a level of maturity that I think that you need to, you need to get to. I'm confident I would have been able to probably hurry that along a little bit had I have started exposing myself to some more mindful content before then. But yeah, to to sort of jump on that point, you're totally right. To talk about was there a a moment or what can I remember around about that time that kind of started to propel me towards doing the introspective work? Mm. Um, There wasn't anything in particular. There was a number of experiences on the show, stuff that wasn't aired, where I just remember being sat there and thinking this really is not me. Right. Hearing one of the lads talk about the car, the AMG Mercedes Black Edition 63, 6.3 litre, this car he was going to get. And then for me to find out the next day that he didn't have a driving license. <laughs> I was like, this is yeah. not my world at all. Yeah. And that's one that sticks in my mind that made me think, right, like you, you, you're not these people. And that is not for me to say that the guys who are there in any way more or less valuable in terms of what they have to say, it's just that we weren't existing on the same plane. No, it's different. And I think the, the, the real issue for them, that may not be a disconnect. No, they were living, so this is what I say, they Absolutely. were living their truths, yes. right? They lived their truths on them. That's what made them good cast members and that's what made me a bad cast member. Right. The reason that I wasn't tremendously successful on Love Island was because I wasn't speaking my truth yeah. forward. The reason I wasn't speaking my truth forward was because I was terrified of what would happen if I did. Yeah. So, perfect example, I'm sat down on the first night, anyone who's seen season one, episode one, I'm sat down with Danielle, she's next to me in the bed, and she looks at this tree, and it's outside of the lines, it never made it on the, on the edit, looks at this tree and mentions something about it. Can't remember what it is. And I just, like, whipped off some quote about, oh, it's because of the blah, blah, the Coriolis effect of the earth, or whatever it might yeah. be. And she turned and said, oh, that's really clever, like, can you say some more clever things? And I was like, oh, fuck, fuck, like, that's not, what, <laughs> that's not what Chris in this situation is supposed to say. Right. So I'm like, right, I need to start playing the game again. I need yeah. to start dumbing myself down or I need to begin this rhetoric, which is more typical to what I think yeah. that people want from me. Um, so that's a good example, I guess. I think that this is really interesting because what really jumps out from the conversations we've had and just previously is how destructive not being yourself and listening to that, to the real you is. Even if it, I mean... We're all going through this life. It all takes different stages to actually discover or actually realise you've got to discover who you are first, Mm -hmm. yeah? But actually, the impact of not doing it, yeah, it can be disastrous. It's very, very bad. So Jordan Peterson, anyone who's listening and knows my podcast, is my favourite thinker. And he talks about enacting the logos, which is speaking your truth forward. Yeah. Um, And for me, learning to be able to tell the truth was probably the most important thing that I could do. And that meant truth if I felt vulnerable, truth if I felt sad, truth if I was interested in something, truth if I had an opinion about mm. what some, some of my friends were doing. And very quickly, the truth, the truth to me is kind of like a superpower, mm. right? Because it insulates you from ever being wrong. It insulates you from ever being uncompassionate because all that you're doing is speaking forward what's inside of you. But it's quite difficult for people to tell the truth. It sounds bizarre because it's one thing that everyone's always got at their disposal all the time, supposedly. You actually don't. A lot of the time when you look inside and you don't really know what you think, you don't have the truth inside. So how much do you think is that a because for all those things that we touched on around things like fear of either upsetting people or of um, rejection. rejection? And then you're straight back into the... I mean, that's the core of self-esteem. Well, that's really what we're talking about. Just coming back to practical times, because it's, it's, it's some people who might be listening or trying to, who are struggling themselves with depression or anxiety or some of the issues, even just, just not knowing who they are, but they realise not who they are. What were the practical things, steps that you took? What were the first things that you did? How did you get on this path of self-discovery? Mm-hmm. So I recently did, um, I had to write the about me for <laughs> the podcast that I do and as a part of that I I tried to distill down what I'd done over the last few years because there was a point that I was at 
which a lot of people may be at. And there's a point that I'm at now, which is better. Now, I'm in no way self-actualized. I'm no. not, I, you know, I still suffer with depressive episodes. Hmm. And I don't really know where I'm going, but I've got a good idea of the path that I took to get here. And I understand the tools that I used. I think the first thing that, the, the first time that I really, really started to re-look at depression was when I read Johan Hari's book, Lost Connections. Right. Um, and in that, he talks about how depression currently is being diagnosed as an imbalance of chemicals in the brain. Yeah. And a lot of people will believe that that's the cause of depression or that that's their reason for depression. And one of the problems with that, apart from the fact that it's wrong based on what a lot of the research says, mm -hmm. Another problem is that it makes you feel very helpless about that. Like, what are you supposed to do? If you've got this imbalance of... It's the same as being diabetic. Do you know what I mean? Like, stop being diabetic. Allow yourself to process glucose. You're like, well, I can't. In exactly the same Absolutely. way as that's the situation it puts you in. Yeah. What I realized very quickly was that I wasn't fulfilling any of the foundational principles that I needed to, to at least make myself prepare to be happy. Forget the self-esteem and the introspective work and all of that sort of stuff forget all of the more kind of ephemeral nebulous stuff and just focus on the fundamentals a consistent sleeping and waking pattern i was a club promoter so for a long time i had a very chaotic one i still do but i'm able to mitigate it now because i've got a plan in place right. seven to eight hours sleep a night if you have under six and a half hours sleep for five days in a row you begin to start showing the same effect as someone that's pre-diabetic yeah that's not good. No. Sleep and wake. Nutrition. Around about the times when I was going to be doing a lot of partying or a lot of work, I'd get up, have a bowl of cereal at one in the afternoon, have a Domino's at 6 p.m. and then go back on the lash. That's not fantastic. Your brain and your mm. body is built purely from the things that you put in your mouth. Like, what's my body made out of? It's made out of Budweiser's and Domino's. <laughs> like, that's not, that's not a very good environment no. to exist in. So I got my sleep right. I got my nutrition right. I've always exercised, but it wasn't consistent. Right. I changed to do CrossFit, which meant that I was spending a lot more time outside, a lot more fresh air, big open spaces. It's a lot more social. In terms of, <clears throat> in terms of connections, I had, I had friends at the time, and I then doubled down on the ones who... I was able to talk with most about the things that were most meaningful to me. Right. I started up a podcast with the guys who that really resonated with, and I got to spend a lot more time with them. So for me, focusing on the fundamentals, get your sleep right, get your nutrition right, make sure that you're exercising consistently. Yeah. Have a job that at least makes you feel remotely fulfilled where you've got the, the, the level of creativity that you desire within your life, a little bit of independence start to build some relationships with people that think like you and that you can be honest and truthful mm -hmm. with and actually genuinely care about you. One of Jordan Peterson's rules for life is be friends with people who want the best for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then after I'd got those things right, the trickle-down effect of that was that I was able to... I was able to have something like compassion for myself. Yeah. Self-compassion was then able to come in because I was able to think, well okay, like I, I, I'm, the clarity of my thoughts is at least remotely okay because I'm not built out of Budweiser and Domino's on three hours sleep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, after that came learning. Yeah. But obviously they're your, your platforms from which you then built, which enabled you to start looking at actually the wider you, if that makes sense. Exactly. What, I mean, one of the things when we're working with recovery, we look at things you don't exercise, sleep, sex, is really important to understand your sexuality and actually to have a positive appreciation for that slightly differently maybe to what you might have had before mm -hmm. when you were the big club promoter etc mm -hmm. you know we, we won't go into that but have you changed your has that been a feature of how you view things as well or has that changed how so for in terms of your pattern of your sex life or how that works, is it less... Um... Transactional? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and because obviously this is one of the big disconnects is where you have a transactional relationship with people, be it either personal, physical or whatever, mm -hmm. actually it changes how it impacts on you as well. I understand. I don't think... I think for me, thankfully, sex was one of those areas that didn't ever suffer um, right. in terms of... 
I was never self-reflective about it or kind of self-abusive about the way that I was using sex or right. that I was being used for sex or however yeah. you want to put it across. That wasn't ever a real concern for me. Yeah. Um, but certainly now I view any relationship with a lot more... It's a lot more sacred to me. Right. Again, to go back to Jordan Peterson, be attractive to many women but choose one. Yeah, That's the... I think it is emotionally a more healthy way to be as a man. Yeah. And I, I think there's very few people, very few men for whom that's actually not true. Yeah. And I think that they'd be very surprised to hear it because they believe that the zenith of success as a man is be attractive to many women and sleep with even more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Whereas actually, and this is really at the core because it's about getting in touch with your, the emotional side of you and to see how the impact it has not just for that short period but actually w- these sort of relationships are more than that mm-hmm. and actually quite often when you see people and you see it with things like sex addiction porn addiction things like this really in all of these issues actually they become the issues becomes the disconnect from who you are that actually causes the problem well if i think it's if you're on a night out and mm-hmm. you like no one knows what the right number of dates is yeah. to have before you sleep with someone, but it's probably not one. <laughs> like, as a rule of thumb, it's probably not one. And the reason it's not one is because if it's one, you're low hanging fruit. Mm. By definition, you are low hanging fruit. Like, is that what you really want to think of yourself as a sexual partner that you're low hanging fucking fruit? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I think with regards to the sex thing, I, I, I treat relationships a lot more sacred now. I'm, even for the girls that I'm around and I don't have a sexual relationship with, I'm just generally a lot more compassionate mm. to them. And it, that, that to me is more fulfilling than a lot of the, well, all of the one night stands. Yeah. You know, that, to me, that's, it's easy come, easy go, right? Another vehicle which sometimes people... Um, well, quite often people hurt themselves with is alcohol. Now, we were talking earlier on that like you've done a number of situations where you go drive for set, at certain periods and mm-hmm. stuff like that. How's that helped you, do you think? So I've done six months sobriety twice now. Mm. Um, and that was... Uh, the first one was about 18 months ago. And that was when I really, really wanted to double down on, um, on my personal progression. There's a... A blog called The Illuminated Man and if you search that there's something called Monk Mode which they talk about focusing on the three eyes which are introspection, introspective work isolation and I uh, can't remember what the third one is anyway the point is that you isolate yourself for a significant period of time from the things that you know that are bad for you and for yeah. me alcohol knocked me off so I'm naturally a depressive person for anyone who's mm. listening if you have depressive tendencies and your hangovers are worse than the night out you're netting a negative, give up alcohol. Mm. And it just sounds so paradigm shifting that people go, oh, well, no, no, because I go out on a night out because that's what everyone else does. It's like, right, yes, that's fine, but you don't have to. Like you do not need to go on a night out and wake up the next day and hate yourself because that's what's going to happen. If you continue to do the same thing with a bad result, Mm. you know what's going to happen the next time you go out and you get leathered, it's not going to change. The way you feel the next day is not going to change. Mm. So for me, I decided to do sobriety. It meant that I doubled down on being productive. And for two periods of six months, I did it. Um, Then recently came back, had a couple of nights out in Newcastle. Neither of them were, or none of them were traumatic or tremendously bad. But very quickly, I just thought like, this isn't, this isn't for me anymore. Mm. I didn't enjoy the night out anywhere near enough to suffer the consequences the next day. And the thing that's really insidious about alcohol is that you get diminishing margins of return of enjoyment over time, but you get an exponential increase in suffering. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as those two lines cross each other, all that you're doing is making yourself hurt for no more enjoyment. Absolutely. Um, And, And, I mean, again, this is... People have to make their own choices. Quite often what we see is what the relationship is with the be it the vehicle that we're talking about. We're talking about higher and lesser vehicles, for example, be it sex, be it alcohol, be it relationships which are unhealthy, etc. With alcohol, you've also got the, with it being a chemical, you've got a naturally depressing, it's a depressant. 
So it's going to reinforce anything, and it actually really cuts across if people are on things like antidepressants, for example. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting... So where, where next for you, Chris? What, mm-hmm. what do you think? Where, what's, where's your path heading now? I'm not too sure where my path's heading now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I get maybe a message a day, message every couple of days from people who listen to the podcast that say that it's really changed them and it's helped. Right. And that... I've never had someone come out of a club night and come up to me and say, man, do you know what it is? Like, I was feeling alone or I was on the brink of destruction mm. or is this, that and the other. But when I heard, I heard those banging tunes and those one pound <laughs> Jaeger bombs in there, it just changed me. <laughs> and you're like, that's never happened. That never happened to me, right? No. And I didn't know how hungry I was for helping people until it occurred. And again, it all comes back to this transactional relationship. It's very, very short-lived, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Moving forward, I want to continue to help people understand how I got from where I was to where I am now. Right. Um, in a sentence, that's it. I, I, I did a lot of introspective work and an analogy that I use is introspective work is a lot like turning over dirty stones. For every one that you turn over that's clean, there's 20 that are disgusting and have something terrifying underneath. Mm. And it, you need to be incredibly brave to be able to do that. Mm. Like it, it isn't easy to... It's not easy to ask yourself questions that you really don't even know, want to know the answer of. Mm. Um, so for me, spending a lot of time with mindful content, further learning about myself, further learning about evolutionary psychology, learning about cognitive biases and, and, and spending time around people who hold me to a high standard. So some of the rules for life that I try and stick to, I've got 40 that are on my wall. Um, number one is tell the truth. Number two is do not do the things that you hate. Mm. Number three is act so that you can tell the truth by how you act. Those first three rules, if you can get those first three done, mm. you're on a really good path to actually living a life that is pretty fulfilling. Mm. Um, you know, I think to summarize, I'd, for anyone who's listening, find me on Instagram, give me a message. I'd love to help you. Um, but focus on telling the truth. Yeah. Focus on living a life as close to virtue as you can find. Work out what your principles are. So principles are things that you will not compromise on yeah. no matter what the situation is and derive from that your virtues in life, right? Mm. Every time that you compromise on your principles, your brain's keeping a counter. That's like a doorman stood on the door of one of my club nights, he's keeping a counter. One, two, three, four. And that, that's really, that for me was the first part of losing self-respect was the fact that I wasn't even prepared to be myself and then I'd done yeah. it for so long I didn't know who I was. So, Tell the truth. Find some people that you know that are good for you. Rule number six, be friends with people who want the best for you. Yeah. People who want the best for you don't tell you what you want to hear. They tell you what they need to hear. Yeah. So it's not giving you comforting words. It's not feeding you sugary sweets. It's telling you what you need to hear. Mm. So if you're around friends that keep on just being yes men to you or never question you when you do something wrong, they're not really friends. No. They're just people that are yes men. Get your sleep and weight cycle sorted. Sort your nutrition out. Get some relationships that are meaningful. Clean your room, tidy up your room, a domain of competence that you're going to be able to live within. And then listen to Johan Hari on Joe Rogan. Podcast is unbelievable about depression. Listen to Matthew Walker on Joe Rogan. It's about sleep. Listen to any of the things with Jordan Peterson on there. Listen to any of the things with Sam Harris on there. If you manage to spend 50 hours of time and attention listening to those podcasts, you will begin to understand what the path is that you need to take for yourself. Oh, that's great, Chris. And just to add to something else you mentioned earlier, in terms of the medical model, that sort of chemical model that somehow depression is an imbalance, etc. Unfortunately, that's the mindset that has shaped treatment services. And actually, if you look at the level of antidepressants, which have gone up by, in some areas by 300% in the past 10 years, this is the this is the, what actually you're seeing and it's, is the impact of that mindset. So if you'd left, had one message to sort of say in terms of to anybody who's listening to this, if, who, uh, who actually don't know what those questions are, would it be, the, would be to talk to family, friends? Would it be to listen to these podcasts or a combination of those? What, what, what would you suggest to somebody? As a final message, I'd yeah. say that you need to... Let me think. As a final message, I think that you need to 
first off, find some people who you genuinely can connect with. Right. It's difficult for people. If you're a rugby lad who happens to have a little bit of a deep side to them and you're around other rugby lads, it's going to be tough. But we're all connected by the internet. Yeah. Like, go on Reddit, work out what it is that you enjoy and go on Reddit and there will be a community of people in there who will think like you. Right. Um, for me, I made the majority of my transformation introspectively or emotion, in terms of emotional intelligence through crushing amounts of appropriate content. Right. So I listened, I watched, I read a ridiculous amount and I could have done it. I'm sure there would have been a much more logical way to have followed it through and I'm sure anyone who's listening will be able to find a much more expedited way of doing it. Yeah. But sheer time and attention of just listening to things that you care about, listening to things that help you understand yourself because there's more connections in a single square centimeter of human brain tissue than there are stars in our galaxy. Hmm. Our inner universe is so complex and people just presume it doesn't come with an instruction manual. Like it doesn't at all. And I don't know the cheat codes to it either. Like no. it's not like someone's got unlimited yeah. happiness cheat codes sat in the back pocket. It's that they have got some habits, some principles that they stick to on a daily basis that they know that are good for them. Mm. So I think plan some goals is a good way to do it. We're teleological beings and telos, it means target. Yeah. Um, teleological beings so make yourself some plans what do you want to be do you want to be happy mm -hmm. okay so you want to feel fulfilled in six months time or in 12 months time how are you going to instantiate that on a daily basis I'm going to get up at the same time I'm going to eat well I'm going to be grateful another thing that I would suggest using to anyone is journaling like mm -hmm. gratitude journaling um, but yeah I think as a, as a parting note Everything that you've got about your own, or the vast majority that you have, as a parting note, anything that you're suffering with is within your control to change. Mm. You may need some help from some friends, you may need some help from a doctor, but changing your environment and changing the basics will make so much of a difference, so much more than relying on medication. I the the male fear of uh, admitting to medical problems is so pervasive that I never ever once considered even thinking about taking antidepressants mm. because that would have been even more shame. And I mean, mm. that's, that's even worse. Like to think that I wouldn't take a medication or even ask for it you're to try doctor. and help me. Yeah, yeah. I, it shows how insidious depression can be. Oh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, you know, anyone who needs to speak, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, email me or message me I'll always reply that's great Chris thanks very much been a real pleasure cheers mate